Hello everyone and welcome to The Good Old Gamer. Very excited for today's video as it's going to mark a shift in the perspective of the channel. Um, the new goal is to basically just get gamers into games instead of focusing solely on hardware and the newest stuff and how much faster it is. Instead, we're going to start focusing in on what it actually takes to run the software well enough that will make sense for the vast majority of you guys. So to kick things off, we're going to start off taking a look at CPUs. What CPU level, like what performance level do you really need to play modern games? And I decided to start things off with the old veteran, 2011's Core i5-2500K. This thing is an absolute legend and has been used by probably most of you guys at some point in time. Now, this is an old Core i5, 4-core, four 4-thread four CPU that many people would write off as being impossible to run modern games well. So I wanted to test that theory out and see if it was possible. Steve from Hardware Unboxed uncovered that using NVIDIA GPUs added an additional 25 to 30% CPU performance overhead compared to an AMD graphics card. So today we're going to be using the RX 6700 XT as a powerhouse of an AMD graphics card paired with the i5-2500K and see if that additional CPU overhead will allow such an old CPU to run modern games. Now, today's video is made possible by you guys. All of you guys out there, by liking, sharing, subscribing to the channel, that's super helpful and tells YouTube that this is a good channel and they can recommend it to people, as well as everybody who supports the channel directly by becoming a member, by clicking the little join button down below. They gain access to the After Hours Technomics podcast and ask questions on the podcast, as well as all of the Patreon members. Links are in the description below if you want to join up and join the community and help fund and support endeavors like this. All right, so before we go into the test bench and the parts used, I do want to make it clear that I do not recommend anybody out there go out and buy a 2500K and pair it with a Radeon RX 6700 XT. This is obviously an unbalanced pairing. The reason why we're doing this is to mitigate or eliminate as much GPU overhead as possible. We want to be as CPU limited as we possibly can. This is why all tests are done at 1080p. They are done at high or ultra settings. It will be listed on a per game basis. With that out of the way, of course, the star of the show is the i5-2500K. This has been overclocked to 4.4 gigahertz. I've had probably a dozen of these CPUs at this point in time, and all of them could hit 4.4 gigahertz. And if you're buying a K-SKU CPU, you need to overclock it. So this is like the best case scenario for the i5-2500K. And as mentioned, this is paired with an MSI Mech 2 uh, RX 6700 XT, 12 gigabyte, no overclocking done here. This GPU is way powerful enough to satisfy an i5-2500K at 1080p. So no overclocking necessary here. For the motherboard, I used an Asus Maximus Gene Z68 motherboard. Actually got a really good deal on this, and I like the Maximus lineup from this era of motherboards. So yeah, that was definitely an easy way to go. Paired that with 16 gigabytes, two times eight gigabytes, Crucial Ballistics uh, DDR3-1600 CL9. So not the fastest memory in the world, but pretty stock standard. That spec for DDR3 has, was most common. So I figured let's go with common spec instead of doing something like 2133CL9, which would be like the top of the line premium stuff from the time. So I wanted to go with what most of you guys, if you actually have one of these old CPUs laying around, might have in terms of memory. For storage, Kingston was actually kind enough to provide us with a KC600 one terabyte SATA 3 SSD for testing use on the channel. So that worked out very well, and obviously you're going to want an SSD paired with a system with a 6700 XT. Uh, so if you're one of those people that have an i5-2500K laying around and you're still using a mechanical hard drive, you should probably upgrade that to an SSD and give yourself a nice little boost. Now for the cooler, I tried something a little different. This is a new company I've never used before, but it's the Virtu V5 Black Edition. Uh, it came in at a very reasonable price point for a 120 millimeter uh, tower cooler. It's cheaper than the Cooler Master Hyper 212, and it comes with RGB lighting. It's got the powdered black finish. It's got a very premium build feel to it, and it cooled the CPU 
marvelously. As you will see, the temperatures are included in the video footage that we're going to be looking at. And uh, yeah, for only 30 bucks, I would strongly recommend one of these as your next CPU cooler if you don't want to spend a whole bunch of money. Well, already guys, the rest of the specs will be listed down below. Uh, if you're interested in checking any of that stuff out, I will have links so you can go ahead and take a look at all that stuff yourself. And now let's go ahead and take a look at the actual performance itself. The i5 2500K paired with the 6700 XT are modern games playable. Let's take a look. All right, so kicking things off with Metro Exodus. Um, this one is the first game that I tried with the i5 2500K and the 6700 XT. And right off the bat, we're getting over 100 FPS in this title. This was very surprising to me. I was not expecting to see this level of performance from a four core, four thread CPU in 2019's probably best and most demanding game. So yeah, this is actually a very good surprise here and it obviously runs very well. So after that, I decided to get a little ballsy and then go with Cyberpunk 2077, go straight for the big dog. And as you can see right off the bat, starting off 80s, somewhere in the 70s, 80s FPS, I was actually very impressed. I was like, okay, we might be doing pretty good here. We come out of the garage, it drops down in the 60s. Now we're on the street. Now we're in the mid 50s. And I was like, well, this is still fine with a free sync display or VRR display. This is actually doing pretty well so far. However, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit to where things kind of fall apart for us. So once this van starts pulling up and the action starts to commence, that's when things start to really kind of fall apart. Uh, the game actually does dip below 40 FPS there for a little while. And obviously that's not ideal as most free sync ranges are 40 FPS plus. So we want to keep it at least there. So what I decided to do is go back through and redo Cyberpunk 2077 with a 60 FPS cap. So this way we're not pushing over, you know, the 60 FPS like we did before. And this will save the CPU and GPU some horsepower if absolutely necessary under those demanding scenes. And here I'm going to play them side by side for you. And then as you can see, the uncapped version dips down a little bit longer and a little bit harder than the version with the cap frame rate. Uh, that only hits 39 FPS there for a little bit and overall is still a better experience. So this really does demonstrate the reason why if you have some sort of limitation in your system, frame capping helps out significantly with those 1% and 0.1% lows, which are the most demanding scenes. Okay, so next up is Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and this right here, this is going to be in the village sequence, which is very, very CPU demanding. Um, this is probably one of the most CPU demanding scenes in any modern game that I've seen. So it starts off pretty good. We were around 60 FPS, but then very quickly we can see we're dropping into the mid 40s. Now, not to say that this is unplayable, it's still pretty good. And like I said, with a VRR display, which obviously my HDMI capture that you're seeing is not, so you are gonna see screen tearing. Um, you know, it, it's not going to deliver a bad experience, but obviously it's not ideal running with, you know, 45 FPS. Uh, between 45 and 55 seems to be kind of the range that we're seeing here. Now, as we get towards the end of the benchmark, you're gonna see that 60 FPS cap get hit again. So what this really means is for the majority of this game, uh, 60 FPS is not really going to be a problem while you're exploring tombs and doing stuff and running around the jungle. Uh, I went ahead and ran the Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the built-in benchmark, and you can very clearly see it by this first scene where it's running at 60 no problem up until you see a lot of NPCs on the scene. That's when we start running into issues. So while I wouldn't say this game is unplayable, it's definitely not ideal, very much similar to Cyberpunk 2077. All right, so next up is Doom Eternal, and to nobody's surprise, this game runs like a boss. Um, it's software, I don't know what sort of magic that they use, uh, but their game engines are just ultra optimized. So we're well over 144 FPS here. So even high refresh gaming on the i5 2500K, not a problem. And in some sequences, it will jump over 200. But I'd say anywhere from 120 FPS to like 180 is gonna be kind of your average. So yeah, this game, not a problem whatsoever. 
All right, next up is Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and this is probably one of the worst showings that we've seen. Uh, typically, like even Cyberpunk and Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we're looking at low to mid 40s, somewhere in the 50s. Uh, this right here, we're looking below 40 FPS, so like 38 to like 45 FPS is the range. So this is obviously the canned benchmark, but what I find kind of interesting is if you look at the CPU utilization, uh, it's actually saying that it's only like 60%. And we can see even on the single core, uh, you know, on the individual cores, I'm not really seeing it jump much higher than about 80%. So this might actually be a situation where we may not even be CPU limited, but memory limited on top of CPU limitation. There's obviously much, much, much more going on here. Um, but this game, unfortunately, I would say is probably unplayable. Uh, Cyberpunk and Shadow of the Tomb Raider, those guys were able to skate by, I'd say 40, 45 FPS on your lows. Um, that's, that's not bad. That's, that's playable with VRR, but with the game dipping into, you know, sub 40 FPS for extended periods of time, unfortunately, I would say Valhalla, this is the first game that I just wouldn't recommend playing at all, even if you have this CPU. All right, next up is Watch Dogs Legion. And as you guys can see here from the numbers, we're seeing very similar type stuff to uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. It's in the 30s, it's in the 40s, it even dips into the 20s at some point. Um, this is just not what I would recommend playing at. I mean, if you have a 2500K and you do a 30 FPS frame cap on this or Valhalla, that'd be okay. But for me personally, PC gamers should demand 60 FPS averages at the very least and let FreeSync and VRR kind of take over from there. But if we're not getting anywhere near a 60 FPS average, yeah, th these games need to be capped at 30. So I'm going to say that, nope, this is also another fail for the i5 2500K. At least on this one, we can see the CPU utilization is where it's supposed to be. So there's no other bottleneck there. Um, you can definitely tell one core is getting maxed out at any given time, and that's what's really holding this back. All right, so last up, I tried Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, I was only able to get this benchmark to run once. Only once. It ran through once, uh, and then every time thereafter, I cannot get this benchmark to run again on the 6700 XT. I keep getting driver crashes. But even on the initial run through, it was solid 60 FPS. This was actually kind of surprising to me because, uh, you know, this is obviously a really nice looking, pretty big game, but... It, it pretty much just locked to 60. So this game, really not an issue. I didn't need to run any other benchmarks because obviously it's going to be very playable on the 2500K. So even though I have limited data, it's a long benchmark. You guys are seeing the footage right here. It's locked. It, it's definitely going to deliver a great experience. Well, already guys, there you have it. Uh, most of the games did not run at 60 FPS or above. So I would say no, definitively the i5 2500K, it's just a little too old, a little too slow to run all modern games, but it did come very close. And if you are using a variable refresh rate or free sync display, the games are definitely playable. So on one hand, no, I would not recommend it obviously, but on the other hand, if you actually have one and you have, let's say like an RX 580 or any decent AMD GPU that'll be able to run these games at basically the max the CPU can handle, you're probably still okay. You're still in the playable range, but you're really pushing the limits there. Now, there were some interesting bits, like Metro Exodus, I was not expecting that. I was not expecting over 100 FPS in any sequence in that game because it's a pretty heavy game, but clearly it's mostly GPU dependent. So they did a really good job optimizing that game for CPU. So they did really well. Obviously, Doom Eternal, same boat, you know, heavily optimized, awesome game. But all the rest of the games, you know, they kind of were in the in line with each other. Uh, you know, that kind of 40 to 55 FPS range, not the best in the world. So this means that, yes, even with an AMD graphics card, the old i5-2500K is not going to cut it. Now, the big takeaway from this video is if you, if you are having like frame stuttering issues or you have a lower or weaker CPU... Smart move is frame cap your games. Running games un with uncapped frame rates just does not make sense unless you're running really high FPS and you have FreeSync or VRR enabled. At that point, they'll run okay. But if you're basically pushing against CPU limits and you're not really at or above that 60 FPS mark constantly, 
you want to go ahead and make sure that you do cap at that 60 FPS because it does bring up that 1% and 0.1% lows, about 10% from what we saw here. Not that big of a deal, but an extra three or four frames might push you into a free sync range versus dropping below it. And that keeps away screen tearing and it will appear as you have a more smooth experience. And overall, you will have a more smooth experience. So that's one of my big takeaways from this video. And of course, I think we could finally put to bed the four core, four thread CPUs. Like I said, after Steve found an extra 25 to 30% performance, considering that's basically the difference between the i5 and the i7 with the hyper threading, I thought there might be a chance there, so I wanted to test it out for myself, but we can definitively say, even with an AMD graphics card, it's not going to be enough to keep these CPUs moving forward. So four core, eight threads, what we're gonna be testing in the next video, and I'm, I'm really interested, because if you think about it, if you can pair a $500-ish graphics card, let's be real, $700 graphics card, with something like a $100 CPU, instead of buying a three or $400 CPU, that extra price increase that we're seeing here, you can offset by not buying a high-end CPU would actually be very beneficial. And that's one of the main benefits to the AMD graphics cards, in my opinion, is being able to save money on the CPU and motherboard and cooling front, and then reinvest that money into the graphics cards as they just don't need as powerful of a CPU as the NVIDIA graphics cards do because they do the processing on the graphics card themselves instead of offloading to the CPU. So it's just another interesting look at how we can kind of mitigate the price increases that we're seeing, maybe spend less on coolers, spend less on motherboards, spend less on CPUs, and then that can offset the cost uh, the rising costs of graphics cards for you here in the future. Well, alrighty, guys, I really wanna hear your thoughts on this down in the comment section below. I know most of you guys probably expected this, but did you expect the 2500K to put up as good of a show as it did? I thought it did fairly well, considering we're talking about an early 2011 CPU. So this is over 10 years old here, and it was like $200, $220 uh, back, you know, 10, 10 and a half years ago. And this thing is still technically playable um that's pretty impressive if you ask me um but once again i want to hear your guys thoughts in the comment section down there below are you guys excited to see the i3 10100 which is basically like an i7 6700 uh because it's a sky lake architecture four core eight thread um that'll be coming here shortly i want to hear your guys thoughts uh we also have the ryzen 1600 i'll be doing this on if you have any other suggestions for cpus feel free to add them in the comment section down below and once again, if you like videos like this, please smash the like button, please subscribe, please share with friends, more stuff coming. And thank you all for your support and I'll catch you guys in the next video.